Good morning, everybody. Bob DeVance for the Dressler Bible Fellowship Group for Sunday, August the 2nd. Glad to have everybody here that's here today. An interesting topic today, uh, one that's been around for a long time and one that I'm sure will never go away. Uh, the, the title, according to the book, is Staying Sober, based on Proverbs 23. And Solomon's advice to his son, dealing with, uh, with alcohol and eating, actually, which the eating area is an area that we don't talk about that much these days, but maybe we should. We'll see. Well, let's take a look at this. What is the title that's staying sober? What does that title bring to your mind? Well, anytime I hear the word sober, I always think uh, alcohol or drunkenness or things dealing with that. Of course, sober can mean a lot of other things. It can mean serious, not just uh, avoiding alcohol. But in, this lesson is dealing with alcohol. So we are going there, of course. Um, if we take this toward drinking alcoholic beverages, then is it fair <clears throat> to expand our thinking into overeating or gluttony, as the, the word is called here in the New King James, or even uh, the use of illegal drugs? And I think probably it's, that that's, that's a fair judgment. We can do that. Solomon does that anyway in talking with his son. So Now, he doesn't mention illegal drugs specifically. Uh, I venture that illegal drugs were not the same problem that, uh, for him that they are for us today. But no doubt there were things there that were not good for them that would have, would have detracted from who they were and what they were trying to accomplish. As for the effects on the mind and the body, though, what are the similarities of these three different topics? Well, obviously... The alcohol world can create some serious problems for us. Uh, the food, overeating or gluttony, obviously can cause us some serious problems, serious health problems, serious health issues. And of course, use of illegal drugs, uh, much like the use of alcohol, can wreak some real havoc on a person's life. Now, we, we don't generally talk that much about the gluttony or the overeating. We generally t focus on the alcohol and the drugs. Why is that? Well, I was listening to Steve Gaines, a pastor at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis this morning, and uh, he had an interesting observation. He said, I would much rather meet a fat man driving a car on a dark country two-lane road at night than to meet a drunk man on that same road under the same circumstances. Well, maybe that's a good observation, isn't it? Uh, alcohol, unfortunately, and, and illegal drugs as well, unfortunately do cause some some serious accidents cause some real devastation with a lot of other people, not just the person who's drinking or using the drugs. Whereas the, uh, the overeating or the gluttony generally affects the individual more. And of course, it can reach further than that, certainly. But generally speaking, I think that's not a bad observation. So with that, let's go on from there. We've been in, in the book of Proverbs since June the 7th when we first started the, the quarter. We've talked about wisdom. Solomon has, has talked about a lot of different facets of wisdom. So what does Solomon have to say about drinking, overeating, use of illegal drugs? Does he have some wisdom to pass on to us for that? And I think, in fact, he does. And of course, also, the Bible in general has quite a bit to say about this topic. Paul, in particular, has a lot to say about it. So with that in mind, Let's take the setting of the whole Bible, starting, though, with the New Testament, with what Paul had to say to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 18. Paul says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise. We've been told to be wise. Now we're told don't be unwise. But understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Wow. You know, dealing with all the words, the wise and the unwise and those things, uh, I think Solomon almost could have written those same words, couldn't he? Paul had an additional angle, though, to his writing to the folks in Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus was a center of pagan worship and, and, and ritual. They worshipped a god called Bacchus, B-A-C-C-U-S. Bacchus was the god of wine and drunken orgies, basically. And they felt that, like, 
If they could communicate with their God Bacchus, they had to be drunk to do that. They had to get drunk on wine to do that. And then in that drunken state, they would be able to determine the will of their God and determine how best to serve and obey him. And of course, the drunkenness often led to the, the orgies and the, the sexual misconduct that went with that, of course. Paul was talking about how to communicate with the God of heaven, though. How to live for him, how to serve, how to obey him, uh, how to determine God's will for our lives. So it was natural for him to draw the con uh, contrast between the God of Ephesus and the God of the Bible and being filled with the spirit of the God of the Bible. Being drunk with wine leads to all kinds of sins, sexual sins and otherwise, immorality of all kinds. But by being filled with the Spirit, we can actually determine God's will and then serve Him faithfully while living a moral life. Now, definition of terms and picking the points just a little bit here. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Paul says that do not be unwise, understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with all of this because it'll eat you up. That's Bob's paraphrase. But instead, instead of being drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? Some have taken that to mean uh, being filled with the Spirit as it was in Acts chapter 2 when the church was initially founded at the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit manifested himself uh, there in physical form and men spoke in tongues and so forth. And that's not necessarily what Paul is talking about here, I don't believe, at all. In this context, in being wise, he's talking about being directed, being influenced, ultimately being governed by the Holy Spirit. This filling then is best understood as a command for the believer to yield himself to the illuminating, convicting, and empowering work of the Holy Spirit. As he, the Holy Spirit, works in our hearts through his work, through God's word, our lives are brought into conformity with the will of God, as it says in verse 17. Now, how do you know if you're filled with the Spirit? If we can define it as we just have, then how do we know that's working? Well, you remember Paul also spoke to the Galatians in 522, in which he said, the fruit of the Spirit is. Notice he didn't say fruits as individual things, but this is a, a composite list, rather. There's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. So if we have the Spirit in our lives, if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we will see some of these manifestations of the Spirit in our lives. And in particular, I'd like to pick on that last one, the self-control. When it comes to drinking alcoholic beverages, using illegal drugs, or eating way beyond our capacity, is it not a matter related to self-control? And the Holy Spirit, being in our hearts and lives, if we're filled with him, wants to help us with self-control. Now, let me hasten to say I would be the first to say I need that. Uh, my lack of self-control oftentimes is discouraging to me, to say the least. I don't exercise that very well. Fortunately, the Holy Spirit also is the one who thumps me on the ear and reminds me of his presence in my life and how I should be acting. Not that I always do that, but he reminds me of what I should be doing in all of these areas of my life the drinking, the drugs, the eating, everything, as well as the rest of my life, of course, obviously. Well, let's go on from there. How does Solomon set the stage to talk to his son about these serious issues? Proverbs 23, 17 and 18. Again, I'm reading from the New King James, as I always do. <clears throat> Those two verses say, Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. For surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. The uh, Holman Christian Standard has a little bit different take on it. It says the same thing, but in words maybe easier to understand. It says, uh, don't let your heart envy sinners. 
Instead, always fear the Lord, for then you will have a future and your hope will not be dashed. So as we look to the future, we do have a future. We have a hereafter. I like that term hereafter. We do have a hereafter, both tomorrow and the hereafter, that is the life that follows this life. Either way, I think what Solomon is saying applies. We look toward tomorrow and we look toward the distant future, the hereafter, knowing that our hope is the real thing. We'll not be cut off from that. Our hope will not be dashed or trashed. But we want to be zealous for the fear of the Lord. Remember we talked about the fear of the Lord doesn't mean a terrified, quaking in one's boots type of fear. That's not the fear we're talking about. We're talking about tremendous, deep respect for God. Some call it reverential awe for God. Wanting to follow him, wanting to please him. Last week, we spent our time talking about pleasing God, wanting to be pleasing in his sight, doing what he's asked us to do. So Solomon is saying to his son, don't let your heart envy the sinners. Don't get, in, don't get mixed up too much with the sinners so that they pull you down. But instead, be zealous to follow God. Looking toward tomorrow and the great hereafter, and your hopes will be made complete. Where does he go from there? So Proverbs 23, 19 through 21 says, Hear my son and be wise. Sounds like Solomon, doesn't it? And guide your heart in the way. The guide your heart, I think, is the Holy Spirit's uh, use of the term self-control. Do not mix with wine bibbers. Now, that's not a term we use often today, or those who would uh, do a lot of drinking. Do not uh, mix with the wine bibbers or the gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will, will clothe a man with rags. So what is this caution here to his son? Don't get too involved with those who are heavily involved drinking alcohol or totally addicted to, to eating and, and putting that above all else. Don't, be, don't cast your lot with them to the point that you don't have any relief from that. You know, how often have people said, well, I'll join them, and by, by associating with these people, I'll bring them up to my standard. But how well does that generally work? Rarely does that work. Instead, the bad will tear down the good. We see this often demonstrated uh, in, in prospective marriages. A young couple is getting ready to get married, and he or she may say, well, I know my prospective spouse is not a Christian, but I am, and once we get married, I will influence him or her and, and lead them to be a Christian. And we know from the statistics that rarely does that happen. It just doesn't work out that way. So we have to be on guard about that. And I think Solomon knew that. So he was cautioning his son against his associations with those who were into too much wine and maybe into too much food, maybe into too much of any kind of, of excess, wouldn't you say? Associations with other people were very important and to be guarded. Wisdom demands that one, that is one who's, especially one who is a Christian, choose his or her associates carefully. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Essentially, Paul is saying if you continue to associate with those that bad company, it will drag you down and you will lose your moral conviction and standing. Paul knew that. Paul nailed it for Solomon, basically. He's backing up Solomon, I think, here. As Solomon goes on to warn his son, what would happen if he pursued these kinds of friendships? Ultimately, what would happen? Well, they would come to poverty, basically. And how many times have we seen this happen with alcoholics in particular who lose their jobs, who lose their family, who lose their prestige, and eventually lose everything they have and wind up uh, essentially on the street? It's a sad situation to fall that far, but it does happen, as we know. Well, <clears throat> let's see. Before we really get into this, what does the Bible have to say about alcoholic beverages? Let, let's do a, a biblical perspective on this first, and then we'll come back and pick up 
what Solomon is saying, because Solomon corroborates what the rest of the Bible has to say, obviously. Well, first of all, is drinking, alcoholic beverages, is drinking forbidden? The short answer for that is, no, it's not forbidden. Not at all. And then, is the use of wine presented in a positive light anywhere in the Bible? And short answer again is, yes, it is. So let's look at a couple of those. John uh, 2, 9 and 10. You'll recall this situation where Jesus turned the water into wine. When the master of the feast tasted the water that was made wine, did not know where it came from, but the servants knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior wine. But you've kept the good wine until now. So Jesus created wine. I remember years ago, I purchased a Bible from a traveling salesman. It was a King James Bible back then. But with it came these coupons, and with which I could send a coupon and a question to this particular Sunday school board someplace, and, and they would answer my question. So I sent one of my coupons in and said, what about drinking? What about when Jesus made water into wine? Doesn't that condone drinking? And they came back with some very interesting observations, uh, some of which now I don't necessarily agree with. But one of their observations was, well, Jesus didn't really create fermented wine. here. What he really created was fresh pressed grape juice because fermentation is a process of decay and Jesus wouldn't create anything that's decaying. Well, that sounds religious anyway. Don't know that I agree with that anymore necessarily. It says he created wine, and I think that's what he actually did. Because how was wine dealt with in that time? Dr. Ron Rhodes, a, a scholar whom I admire greatly, says that wine in the New Testament was generally diluted, oftentimes up to 20 to 1, diluted with water. So basically what you really had was just wine-flavored water. Why would they do that? Because the wine had some purification qualities to it. It would kill some of the bacteria, the germs that were in the, the water, which was oftentimes, uh, for lack of a better term, putrid water. So it would help to purify the water and make it safe to drink. For special occasions, they might even mix the, the wine one-to-one -one, water and wine, you know, 50-50 in other words. But that was extremely rare. And most of the people of the New Testament time, including the Greeks even, considered that barbaric. Only the barbarians would drink that strong a drink. And they would never drink straight wine. That was really considered to be barbaric. So perhaps when Jesus turned the water into wine, he created a, a good, high-quality, perhaps low-alcoholic content wine. Don't know about that. Or perhaps the wine, as he created it, it was made in a jar of water. Perhaps it was already diluted in the right proportion for easy drinking. So that's one occasion where wine is actually presented in a positive light. Uh, what about Timothy? Remember, Paul spoke to his compadre, Timothy, 1 Timothy 5, 23, and said, No longer drink only water. But use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Why would he say that? Wine does have some properties to kill germs, doesn't it? Some disinfectant qualities. Uh, wine may also uh, soothe the stomach, and in, in, in some ways, there have been some studies done showing where wine can actually have a positive impact on blood pressure and cholesterol and various other things if it's handled correctly. But nonetheless, Paul is saying, use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities as a medicinal application. Now, today, we have lots of medicines to take the place of using wine for that. Lots of good medicines, well proven. And then what about, uh, what about the occasion where the good Samaritan helped the man that had been beaten by robbers? It says he poured in wine and oil. Why would he do that? Because they didn't have isopropyl alcohol or mercurochrome back then. So the oil would tend to soothe the wounds, would tend to soften the scabs and such, and the wine as a disinfectant would tend to kill the germs. Just a very practical application for that. 
And again today, we have all kinds of medicines and treatments and antibiotics that take care of those things, as well as uh, painkillers and ointments that will help to uh, ease or numb the pain of different kinds of wounds, of course. Uh, as far as taking wine for medicinal purposes, I remember seeing a cartoon in which the wife was fussing at the husband. And he said, yes, but the doctor told me to take an aspirin and drink a glass of wine every day. And the wife responded, yes, but you're two years behind on the aspirin and three years ahead on the wine right now. Well, I, I think maybe he missed the whole point with the medicinal effect with that, perhaps, but it illustrates what we're talking about. Now, <clears throat> going on from there, what about the fact that drinking can reflect poorly on the Christian as the follower of Christ? When another believer has doubts, when it fulfills a selfish desire, these things can be a reason not to take alcoholic beverages or drugs or to overeat for that matter. What are some scriptures dealing with those things? Let's look at several scriptures for that purpose. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Paul is saying, I will maintain my self-control. My selfish desires will not overcome me to do things I might otherwise do. Romans 14, 21 again. It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. In context, Paul started out talking about uh, food, uh, different kinds of food and food offered to idols and various things like that. And he's saying anything I do, eating or drinking, if it's going to cause a problem for someone else, and cause their faith to be placed in question in their minds, then we just don't do that. It's good not to, to do these things if it's going to cause your brother to have a problem or your sister to have a problem. 1 Corinthians 10, 23, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. A different take on the previous verse we read from 1 Corinthians 6, 12. They don't all edify. They don't all build up, which is one of the things we're commanded as Christians to do. We're to edify or to build up the body of Christ, our fellow Christians. Uh, and lastly, Philippians 2, 3, and 4, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Selfish desire, in other words. Anybody familiar with New Orleans bread pudding? Classically, New Orleans bread pudding is made with bourbon. And generally speaking, you can smell it and you can certainly taste it in the bread pudding. And I'll say, personally, I think it's delicious. But if I am at a restaurant that serves that, and I am with another Christian who is very, very concerned about any association with any kind of alcohol, out of deference to, to that person, I would not order that kind of bread. I just wouldn't do that. Even though the alcohol has been cooked in and a lot of its, uh, its strength has been removed, I still wouldn't do that because that might cause that other person to say, what's he doing? How can he do that? How can he be a teacher? How can he be a leader? How can he act like that? and still claim to be following Christ completely. So there are times when we just back off and we don't do things we might otherwise do. The self-control kicks in again. And then again, I probably don't need the bread pudding anyway, because I'm sure that stuff has got to be loaded with calories. Uh, so I probably wouldn't really need to do that anyway. But that's another discussion. That's a side trip. We'll come back to the eating those some more a little bit later on. Now, notice also that in Paul's instructions to Timothy regarding selection of bishops and deacons, being given to much wine was a disqualifying trait. You'll find that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, where he talks about those two offices. So going overboard with it is condemned. Just flat, just drinking is, is not forbidden. 
I personally choose not to drink, though, because I think it's the right decision for me. I don't want to take a chance that it might disparage someone else, and I can live without it because of that. Going on back to Proverbs now, Proverbs 29, 29 to 32, Solomon starts to talk about some of the effects of alcoholic drink. 29, it says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? And then he answers those questions. Those who linger long at the wine, those uh, who go in search of mixed wine, do not look on the wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. Why? Because at the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. It comes back to bite you, he says, basically. That thing in search of mixed wine generally would, uh, apparently meant Wine that was mixed with various kinds of spices, some of which would in, it would enhance the alcoholic effect of the wine, would make it easier to get drunk, to say it very plainly. And Solomon's saying, you have all these characteristics of those who are, are addicted to wine. They're looking for it. They're, they're watching it. They're admiring it. But what happens in the end, verse 32 says, it bites and it stings. And I'm wondering, do you have any observations on somebody who was a drunk, who lived as a drunk or an alcoholic, and some of their experiences they might have had? Uh, I, I will talk about that more here in just a minute in my personal experience, and perhaps it will trigger some memories that you have as well. <clears throat> Proverbs 23, 33 to 35, going on through the end of the chapter. Your eyes will see strange things. And he's, again, talking about the person under the influence of alcohol. Your eyes will see strange things. Your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like the one who lies down in the midst of the sea, or like the one lies on top of the mast, saying, They struck me, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I didn't feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? Wow, that's, that's actually a pretty dire picture he's painting, isn't it? One who is under the influence of alcohol may say some strange things, may hallucinate, see things, certainly th see things in a light which they would not view things were they sober. They may get hurt. They may be abused in many different ways and not realize it. How many times have I, especially when I was in the service, have I heard young men in particular the next day after a weekend say, well, we went out and, and we got drunk and we did this. And, and, and after that, I don't remember what happened. I just know I, I woke up back in the barracks the next day. Didn't even remember what happened. And I've often said for us as Christians, we come together and we have a party, we eat. Uh, we have dessert. We do whatever we do. We drink our iced tea and soft drinks and other things and have a great time together. Get up the next morning with nothing to be ashamed of and no hangover. I think that's the, the best world you could ask for. Go have a good time and party and not feel guilty the next day or have a hangover as a result of it. We don't have to deal with some of those things that some of the alcoholics deal with in a very real situation. Well, let's see. Those who are addicted to strong drink subject, are subject to acting out of their minds, out of their heads. Wow, and that's so very true. Okay, we've been focusing primarily on the drink and even maybe the drugs, which are essentially in the same category for purposes of our discussion. But do these principles that are as they're presented by Solomon apply to gluttony? Do they apply to overeating? Where does all that come from? Gluttony, again, is not a word that we use a lot today. Is this disparaging remark from Solomon in verse 21 applicable to us today when he said, don't be associated with the gluttons? Is there a major distinction between overeating and gluttony, by the way? Well, I think there is. I think the distinction, overeating, 
happens to all of us from time to time. We eat a little bit more than we should. We don't stop eating when we should. Gluttony, on the other hand, is being addicted to food, just like the alcoholic is addicted to alcohol and always looking for some way to get another drink. The one who is, is a glutton is always looking for more food of some sort. And oftentimes, as we read about those who are addicted to food, we find uh, they'll be sneaky about it, be sneaking around trying to eat when nobody's looking, and essentially gorging themselves to their own detriment, quite obviously. And of course, Solomon has said that the, uh, the getting drunk and the gluttony both lead to poverty, and certainly that can be true. In the case of gluttony, it can certainly lead to ill health many different ways, uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, slowing down the functions of the brain, and of course, diabetes, which is a very present reality today in our society. Wow. What is your story? What experiences do you have with this? Now, uh, in this session, obviously, I can't receive your feedback. However, if you'd like to email me and tell me about some of your experiences, it certainly will be confidential, first of all, but I'm not going to tell anybody else or read it to anybody else, but I'd just like to know. Uh, and in our live session, we, we will actually ask that same question again and discuss it just a little bit. Well, what about me? At least I can give you my story. And I want to take a couple of minutes and do that. Uh, I, don't, I don't drink. I choose not to drink. I choose to not, not to abuse drugs for two reasons. One, I don't believe it's God's best for me. It's not the best thing for me in God's eyes. Secondly, I grew up in a home that often had a mean drunk in it. I've seen firsthand what alcohol can do to an otherwise good man. And I just don't want to go there. As many of you know, uh, I was reared by my great grandmother. And uh, as a youngster, and uh, all the, they say maybe, uh, well, as she, the first through, through the eighth grades anyway, when I was with her, uh, she had a son who would come and stay with us oftentimes in the summers. And he was a mean drunk. He would come in just as nice as he could be, go out and get a job. I remember on one occasion, he, he was a construction worker. He got a really good job, made some really good money, bought an automobile, and we thought, boy, things are really looking up. He, he accumulated some money, and that was it. Then he started drinking, and he would buy the drink until his money was essentially gone. Then he sold the car, and he drank on that until that was mostly gone. And he, as, as he ran out of money, he lowered his standards for the alcohol that he drank. And at one time, I remember him even drinking brake fluid from a car. And as I said, when he would uh, drink, he was a mean drunk. He was one who wanted to beat up on somebody, to abuse somebody. Uh, total profanity coming out of his mouth all the time. And often not. We'd, the way into the night, we would put up with this mess as he went on with all of that. So I've seen what, what alcohol can do to an otherwise good man, and I don't want any part of that. I really don't want any part of that at all. My stepfather, uh, whom I got to know when I was uh, six years old, sometime prior to that had been an alcoholic. He'd been a heavy drinker at least, and he had quit. And I remember him saying so many times that if he took just one drink, he'd be right back where he started. He wouldn't dare take a drink. And he was very staunch about that. And, and I'm kind of the same way. I, I don't think I'd have a problem with it, but I don't want to chance it. I just don't want to chance it. So I don't do that. On the overeating part or the gluttony part, I don't believe I'm guilty of gluttony where I've had a, a food addiction where I'm just looking for food all the time, and, and that's my total focus in life. No, I, don't, I have not had that. The overeating, however, I have to plead guilty. Uh, sometimes I don't back off when I should. My excuse for that, of course, always got to have an excuse, right? My excuse is that growing up, uh, food was very precious. We didn't waste food at all. We ate all the food that we had, and what we didn't or couldn't eat was fed to our animals, either our dogs or chickens or pigs or whatever else we had as far as animals. Nothing was wasted. I remember fondly uh, my mother-in-law, who was a, an absolutely fantastic cook. When we would come home uh, on leave from the Air Force, 
she would have some of that great food left. And she'd say, Bob, I've just got a little bit of this left. You want to eat this? If you don't eat it, I'm going to have to throw it out. And I, it always worked. I'd sure, give it to me. And I'd eat it. Well, back then I could do that, and it didn't stick to my stomach so much as it does now. I have to really watch that now. Uh, I certainly don't want to get diabetes. I don't want some of the other severe ailments that comes with uh, being way obese. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm not fussing at anybody. Don't take me wrong. I'm just telling you my personal experience with this. Uh, it, it really takes that, that fruit of the Spirit, that self-control, to back away from good food when it's still on the table. Uh, yeah, that's a struggle for me. But I have to do that, and I need to do that. And some days I do better than other days with that. It's a struggle. I have to ask God to help me with that. He's asked His Holy Spirit to give me that self-control to let me back off when I need to back off. Wow. We've talked about some touchy subjects today. Some very personal subjects, I know, for many of us. But the Bible is not silent in this area. And I, my goal, my purpose in this whole thing is to encourage you to see what God's Word says to you. And then observe that. In summary, let's see if we can summarize. Number one, Solomon has good advice on avoiding two of the vices of life. Now, he does mention other vices in his writings. But in this, se in this section, avoid the abuse of alcohol and drugs. They will tear you down. They will take you down. And as he said, in the end, they will bite like a snake. And it's not pleasant. And then abusing food, he doesn't go into the to, the difficulties that come from that, other than uh, saying poverty comes from it. But we know today all sorts of health issues come from that as well. So he gives good advice to back off on those things, not get involved with either of those to my detriment. Secondly, Solomon has some really good advice on choosing one's friends and associates. Don't be overly involved in those who would tear you down. Of course, this, appear, this applies not only to the areas of of alcohol and drugs and food and anything else. It does apply to everything else. Those who would tear you down, be careful about those associations and don't get too close to them, lest you be torn down in the process. And number three, the, the New Testament, especially Paul's writings, gives some definitive advice on these topics. And Paul's take on it, essentially it's a matter of the heart much as Jesus' take on the commandments is a matter of the heart. You remember Jesus said, if you think these things, you're guilty of having done them, committed the physical acts. And I think that's what Paul is saying here. It's a matter of the heart. In your heart, you want to honor God by taking care of other people and not leading other people astray. We want to encourage and build up, not tear down. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday and a great week coming up. Don't forget worship today at 1030.